So my name is Joe Gasparetti. I'm a production engineer at Facebook, and I'm here presenting today with Yang Sha, who's a software engineer. Uh, we work together on Facebook's DR, or disaster readiness team, and we're going to tell you a little bit about a new problem that we started working on in the last year in the DR space. We're calling it subregion failure. So to explain what that jargon means, we'll go through what a user request looks like as it passes through the Facebook system and uh, the DR requirements that we've had for our systems over time. But first, a story. So it's October of 2012, and Hurricane Sandy is bearing towards the east coast of the United States. In its path are not one, but two different Facebook facilities, one in Ashburn, Virginia, and another in Forest City, North Carolina. This was potentially very bad for us. If the hurricane had taken out either site, the entire website would have gone down. We got lucky this time, actually. The hurricane turned north, and at the last minute, ended up making landfall in New Jersey instead of further south, although the storm did pass about 30 miles from the Ashburn facility. But unfortunately, a lot of other people didn't get lucky. Um, and even in places where buildings weren't destroyed, connectivity was severely impacted up and down the northeast of the United States. This was obviously a wake-up call for us. If this type of event happened, it could very easily have compromised the Facebook service. And so that's when the DR team really kicked off in full back in 2012. In the past seven years, we've built the ability to deal now with data center regions going offline for any sort of calamity. Um, but to get some sense of why this was potentially a problem back then, let's walk through the life of a request to Facebook.com. So let's say you pull out your phone, you see a lovely post like this in the Pacific Northwest, um, and you want to click like on it. What happens? Well, your phone issues an HTTP request uh, out to the internet, and that request arrives first at one of our edge pops, or edge points of presence. So these are the places where the edge of the internet ends and the edge of the Facebook network begins. And there are a couple of dozen of these throughout the world. At this point, it hits a software load balancer, which routes it to one of our origin regions. Now, origin regions are the places where we build data center buildings and run the application code of Facebook.com. Let's see what happens inside of one of those. So the request first hits a load balancer, software load balancer, which forwards it to a web server. Pretty straightforward so far. Um, our web server is called HHVM and implements the hack language, um, our variety of PHP in which most of our uh, business application logic is implemented. But as uh, you guys are all aware from working on web services, most web services aren't just a web server. There's a bunch of other stuff in the data center too. And for us, there's a big combination of both stateful services like caches and storage services like databases. And so as this application code inside the web server starts running, a dance of dependency starts between the web server and a bunch of other stuff. My like request first requires a call to Tau, the service which service serves our social graph. And uh, so Tau is just a cache, and it represents the social graph, uh, the nodes and edges of that graph, um, which we call entities and associations. So an entity is something like my user profile or a page or a post. And an association could be something like a like between me and a post or a friendship between two users, two entities. In the case of my like request, um, we fetch the entity associated with me in the post, and some application logic runs and says, you know, is Joe allowed to see this post? Is he allowed to like it? And hopefully that passes, and then I issue my creation of a new association. So that request goes back to Tau to write the new association. But as I mentioned, Tau is actually just a cache for these things, and so to persist my like association, it has to write that data to a backing store. Um, and we use a single uh, primary MySQL setup for this, um, which is what we had in 2012 and what we still have. And this kind of gets back to the crux of the earlier story. So back in 2012, all of these database primaries were in those East Coast data centers. Um, and not only that, we didn't have the ability to fail over. So if we'd taken those regions out, we just would not have been able to write new data to the social graph. Obviously not, not a great situation to be in. And so we spent a lot of time over the preceding few years building that capability um, to move data out of a region if something bad happens. We call that draining the region. And it's not only migrating the databases, um, but also any other service that requires failover, and also rerouting traffic in real time so that in the course of a few minutes, we can take a data center region offline. And if we're doing it right, nobody notices. And we actually run these uh, exercises to test this on a pretty regular basis. The DR team does what we call storm exercises after, you know, inspired by the original event. Um, and on, on storm days, we pick a region at random to suffer a mock calamity and just immediately start draining it without warning anybody else in the company. And a few hours later, if everything goes as planned, again, nobody notices. The region goes offline, comes back online, and uh, everything happens as normal. 
But what we realized sort of over the years was that it was great to have this ability to deal with a whole region going out, but there are more types of DR problems than just hurricanes hitting data centers. And in fact, the larger and larger your infrastructure grows, um, the more sites of part, sorts of problems you see that are smaller or internal to a single data center building. And here's some sense of what I'm talking about here. Um, sort of a Bezos chart here with no, no axes labeled. Um, on the y-axis, we have frequency of events that you might see for failures in a data center. And on the x-axis, you have the number of servers that that outage impacts. The smallest thing that you might see in a data center fail is a single component on a single server, like a hard drive, for example. And if you're sitting on the floor of a big data center, in the order of hours, you will observe some of these components fail. They just happen on a regular basis. But luckily enough, even though they're frequent, they only impact either one or even less than one machine in the case of redundant components, right? Slightly larger than that might be a rack or a collection of racks of servers, say up to 1,000 servers in some one physical location. And these things fail less frequently. You might have to wait months in the data center to observe a whole rack or a couple of racks sitting together to have some sort of co-located issue. But over time, you will observe something like that. Could be power or network, some sort of physical issue. And then even larger than that is the class of thing that a hurricane is, right? A physical calamity, some sort of natural disaster that strikes an entire region full of data center buildings and hundreds of thousands of servers, all the way off on the far right. So our original DR program, which we call regional DR, was really aimed at solving problems on the scale of the full region on the far right. But over time, we started observing more and more problems between these two endpoints of the spectrum. And I'll hand it over to Yang to sort of explain what we observed. Thanks, Joe. Now let's take a look about what we call subregion failures, where a part of a region actually fails. So this is our data center region in Colony, Ireland. It's got a few hundred thousand servers in it. And one day recently, we actually suffered an outage where a few thousand servers lost power. And we ended up draining the entire region. So let's see what that means. So we lost 2% of our servers within this huge facility, but we're going to leave the other 98% idle? What's going on? Are we a bunch of clowns? Well, hopefully not, but um, we'll see about that. Um, so as it turns out, I was on call, and I was wondering, well, first of all, why did a few thousand servers lose power? How could that happen? One of our data center operations engineers told us that a switchboard went down. And I was like, what is a switchboard? So I did my best. I Googled it. <laughs> this is what I found. This thing is called a switchboard. And this specific one powers an entire casino in Atlantic City. I was really excited. In our data centers, we have similar ones. We have lots and lots of these powering machines. So as it turns out, these switchboards power these black boxes that you see called power panels. And each of these power panels then feed a whole row of machines like this, right? So what had happened really was just a switchboard went down, no more power. Then the power panels that it was connected to lost power. And then a bunch of machines lost power as a result. Simple, right? So this is an example of a sub-regional failure which caused what we call a fault domain to fail. And a fault domain is simply just a set of machines that happen to fail together when a sub-regional failure happens. So going back to the original question, why would losing 2% of your machines cause the whole region to go down? That still sounds ridiculous, right? Well, let's go back to what Joe talked about. How do we serve a like request? Let's say that we lost all of our web servers all of a sudden. Well, no matter how much Tau or MySQL capacity we have, we have no machines to run the business logic. Whoops, got to drain the region. Now, let's say we lost Tau instead. It, no matter how many web servers we have alive, if we have no access to the social graph, oops, got to drain the region. And finally, if we have no MySQL instances available, we can't persist anything to the database, no one can like anything, comment anything, or post anything, oops. Got to drain the region. It gets old real fast. So what did this outage actually take out? Well, on the left, you've got a bunch of switchboards. And on the right, you've got a bunch of services that it powers. So in this case, the middle switchboard went down. Let's see what it took down with it. 
Well, it took down a bunch of web servers. But that seems OK. We got web servers in other parts of the data center, and their switchboards are fine. So we can probably take this loss. Not an issue. We also lost a couple of load balancers. You know, not a big deal. We got others to cover for it. Oh, this looks bad. It looks like the majority of our TAL servers are powered by this switchboard. Whoops. We have no access to user data anymore. So this is what caused us to drain the region. Now, I ask myself, were we just a bit unlucky? Was this one of those unicorn switchboards in the data center that if it goes down, the whole region goes down? So I looked at another switchboard. So hypothetically, if the first switchboard fails, would we have to drain the region? Well, let's take a look. There's only a few TAL servers. OK, we got enough redundancy to deal with this. No problem. Oh, this looks kind of bad. The majority of my, my, are my SQL servers on this switchboard. Oh, no. If this went down, we can't persist any data anymore. Got to drain the region. Oh, man. So what I learned was a random switchboard go, goes on fire means that the entire region is completely useless. This is fundamentally an inefficient way of running data centers. When 2% of your machines go down and the other 98% that is just fine can't do anything, that is inefficient. And that is the core problem that the sub-regional failure program is aiming to solve. We must be able to prevent small failures from becoming large ones. So this problem is actually pretty simple if you think about it. I got a switchboard that powers a lot of my SQL servers. I got another switchboard that powers a lot of Tau servers. Why can't I just get Tau and my SQL to swap their machines, and then each one of them will have a smaller amount in each switchboard? Simple, right? Let's just swap some machines, and everybody will be happy. Great. But there's a couple of challenges with this. To serve a like request, these are the four services that you need, right? But to serve Facebook, Instagram, Messenger, and WhatsApp, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of services that are needed. A lot of them are critical. And they have dependencies amongst them. So just to answer the simple question of, hey, if this fault domain fails, which services will be impacted? Hmm, I don't know. And then the next question, uh, what will happen to the other services that depend on these services that just went down? I have no clue. Pretty difficult. The second thing we realize is that there are, there are a multitude of different kinds of sub-regional failures that happen, not just switchboards going down. For example, we've had snakes go into our substation, onto our transformer, and it becomes snake steak. But at the same time, our data centers would lose power. At the same time, we would have issues where servers just go on fire. Lightning strikes, hits our data center or our substation, causing power outages. And we have water leaks. Yes, there's water in a data center, mostly for cooling, not for spraying onto machines. I guarantee you that. Um, so given the fact that there are lots and lots of services that depend on each other, and then we have lots and lots of different kinds of failures, how do we deal with this problem? Joe, can you fix it for me? I'll try, Yang. So as Yang described, we looked at all the types of outages that we had. And the first thing we did was sort of do a study to see what we, what we were dealing with. Um, we had network issues. We had power issues. We had physical proximity issues. And the first thing we decided to do was to try to simplify this problem to align on a single fault domain instead of trying to work on all of these overlapping types of fault domains. So we decided to try to pick a fault domain. Um, and that's a real trade-off. So if you make your fault domain enormous, like the size of an entire region, we've already discussed what the problem is with that, right? Something tiny fails, and now the rest of your fault domain is underutilized. But if you pick a really tiny fault domain, you actually end up with a different problem altogether. If your fault domain is tiny, it's more likely that many of them will be down at the same time, and now you've just given yourself this like multivariable problem where you're dealing with probabilities of n and n plus 2 and n plus 3 fault domains offline. And we didn't want to deal with that either. But we did observe some things by looking at the outages that Yang described. Um, and some patterns that popped out were, first of all, the most prevalent issues we had were electrical ones. Um, and most of those electrical issues could be contained by a switchboard or smaller than a switchboard. 
And so it made sense to us that if we could contain most of the issues at that level, we should just pick the switchboard as our fault domain. And so we ended up at the more simple problem statement. No single fault domain should cause a region outage. We're translated into our new learnings. No switchboard, when it fails, or anything smaller than a switchboard, when it fails, should cause us to have to drain the region. But that still leaves us with the software problem. When a breaker like this one on the left opens, it does not discriminate between the services that it's gonna take offline. And actually, at this point in the project, we got kind of lucky to be connected with some other people in our organization who were working on a somewhat similar side of this problem. Um, they were working in our data centers to maintain the switchboards which we decided would be our fault domain. And this was a pretty painful process for them. They were dealing with the same sort of mess of services, and any time that they had to take a switchboard offline for maintenance, they had to find all of the services that were running on those servers, work with them to migrate all of their load to different servers. A real pain. So we thought, well, maybe we can get together and just do something easier and more efficient for all of us. So we suggested that the data center folks should just flip the breaker. <laughs> this would be great, right? They wouldn't have to do any graceful migration, no data movement, no pestering people to move their services, and we would get free DR tests. <laughs> what could go wrong? Well, we not only had to answer what could go wrong, but since the DR team's job is not to take things offline, and it's a bad look when we do that, we had to not only figure that out, but answer it in advance of the maintenance. So we'd given ourselves a whole new problem. Now we have to answer when fault domain X loses power, because we promised to unplug it, what is going to break? And here's V1 of, of our solution to that problem. It's highly technical, it's a spreadsheet. Um, in the spreadsheet for each row, we put a service that's located on one of the servers in that fault domain, and we went through and looked at each service by hand and said, what's gonna happen when we unplug this service? Will it fail over gracefully, or will we have an issue? And this was a bit tedious, but it actually taught us a ton about the problem. And we learned about some of the different types of systems that live in our data center. We started with the easy ones. So stateless services, things like web servers, right? These services all look mostly the same between their instances, and they're behind some sort of load balancing system. So when one machine dies, the others can pick up the slack. What we realized about these services is that for DR fault tolerance, the most important constraint is the capacity they have available to them. <clears throat> So for example, I might be running a pool of web servers, but it's 75% utilized. That means for DR availability, my constraint is that I may lose no more than 25% of those servers. So if I lose this fault domain in the top left, I have lost four out of my 20 green boxes, and the service is fine. Pretty quickly, we ran out of easy services like this, though, and we ended up on stuff like the cache and the database. And what we realized pretty quickly is that these services actually look a lot different across their instances than the same. It doesn't matter like what percentage of the MySQL primaries you turn offline, or what percentage of the Zookeeper nodes. These services have a different type of constraint. So let's say, hypothetically, I'm running uh, four Zookeeper ensembles, each with five instances in them, right? What I care about is not the percentage of machines that go down, but the number of replicas inside of each of those ensembles. So for five, my five-node ensemble, as long as I lose no more than two nodes, the system will remain healthy. And this turns out to be a thing you can also write in code. And having done that, you can run your check. And so we ended up with V2 of our system, which was, had evolved from a spreadsheet to um, some software, i.e. Python scripts. Um, the software basically consisted of, it's called the auditor, and consisted of some, some code for evaluating these checks that we'd written, paired with some configuration for describing all of the services. And we described the services along the lines of the capacity and shard availability constraints. So we could have our web server and say, for this particular web server, creatively named web server, uh, no more than 25% of its instances can go down, and as long as that constraint is met, we'll say that this fault domain is healthy. Same thing for a sharded service this Zookeeper R5 ensemble. As long as we lose no more than two replicas of each ensemble, the system is healthy. And again, this was a little bit trivial to write because, or tedious to write, because we had to go through every service and actually understand what its constraints were. But at the end of the process, we got a description of these services that we could then apply over the entire infrastructure. And so we could end up with a dashboard like this, where for any region in our data center infrastructure, we could put a box on the dashboard and turn it green if we thought that it would be safe to fail, and red if we thought it wouldn't be safe to fail. 
And at this point, we were pretty proud of ourselves, right? Like we'd looked through all of these services, figured out how they worked, written rules, written software to analyze whether or not they would succeed or fail, and we were really ready for a maintenance. So what happened next, Yang? Well, not everything is gravy in the real world, unfortunately. So we did a few maintenances. In the beginning, we had to learn a lot of, um, a lot of things about how services worked. But eventually, we got to a point after a few maintenances that we were pretty confident about ourselves. I mean, we had already understood a ton of services across all of Facebook. We had encoded it into our nice auditor. So I decided to take a detour and visit one of our data centers in Altoona, Iowa. We were doing a maintenance there where we were shutting off a switchboard. And I was sitting down in the electrical room with our data center operations engineers and vendors who were ready to start the maintenance. They asked me whether or not this is going to go fine. And I was like, don't worry about it, guys. We got this. You know, like, we, we can do this. So what happened next was a data center operation engineer needed to press a button. Literally, it's just a breaker, and there's a red button. You press it, it opens the breaker, and then thousands of machines lose power. Hallelujah, right? So I felt great. And then a few minutes later, there was an alert for Instagram. Apparently, it was spewing 500s to users. I was like, nah, that can't be because of the maintenance. That must be some goofy code somebody pushed. OK, uh, a few minutes later, Messenger started going down in Altoona. OK, this is a little suspicious. We should probably look into that. And then a minute later, bam, all of the alerts came in. Our internal tools started breaking. News feed broke. Oh, our, our, our media service, like all your photo uploads, video uploads, all started breaking. Hell broke loose. But what happened? How could we be wrong? We had the auditor. Well, it turns out that um, we have this thing called MySQL, as you know. And uh, in order, so, and this switchboard powered thousands and thousands of MySQL servers. And they all needed to fail over, right, when power went, went off. So the way they fail over is that they have to write to a coordination service called Zookeeper, basically saying, Hi, hello, I'm dying. Please elect a new master. Ha ha. But Zookeeper, because thousands and thousands and thousands of MySQL servers failed exactly at the same time, Zookeeper could not keep up with the sudden instantaneous load. Right? So the failover failed for many MySQL servers. And guess what happened next? Well, all everything that depended on MySQL to write or read data failed. This is really unfortunate. <laughs> but um, there is actually a hole in this story if you uh, listen carefully. I mean, these MySQL servers just all suddenly lost power, right? Like breaker, poof, right? How does it even have any time to fail over? That makes no sense. Why is that, Joe? Well, it's a good thing you asked, Yang, because I prepared some slides on this. Um, so we have this system called Power Loss Siren we, dealt, we, uh, we wrote for dealing with this problem. Um, and so as Yang mentioned, when you pull the power to something, if it's not ready, even if it's able to fail over, you may not be able to uh, fail over gracefully. So a web server processing a request dies in the middle. We can't retry it. The user's going to see an error anyway. Or a MySQL database that needs to fail over its primary. While that primary is failing over, the database is going to be unwritable. But we actually have sort of a hack around this. This is a picture of one of our open rack racks. Um, and one of the features of open rack v2 is that inside of this rack, there are batteries. So instead of keeping you know, DC UPS batteries alongside in our data centers, we use batteries inside of the rack itself to perform power failover. So if a utility goes down, for example, and we need to move to another utility or to generator, the rack is actually self-sufficient during that time. But it means the power supplies know whether or not they're receiving upstream power. And we can leverage that to our advantage. Let's take a look. So with 90 seconds left inside of our batteries, power fails to a rack. At this point, the, the software running on side of the power supply notifies the top of rack switch that something is wrong. And our top of rack switches are actually just Linux boxes, so we have a little daemon there listening for this signal. Now it takes, 90, or it takes like 10 to 20 seconds to fail over generally for us to move to generator or to another utility source. So if we reach halfway through the battery, about 45 seconds in, 
we know that things are probably not going to go well. Um, and at this point, the switch makes a decision to tell the host in the rack, uh, hey guys, um, we're gonna lose power soon. And that means that the services inside of the rack can run some custom logic. So if you're a web server, you might decide to change your load balancing metrics so you don't receive any new requests but can finish the ones you're currently processing. If you're a database, you would, for example, if you're running a primary, fail the primary over outside of your rack. And that means that when the power eventually dies, 90 seconds have elapsed, nobody even notices that it failed. And so the combination of stuff like power loss siren, um, the auditor, and the testing really helped us make a bunch of progress on this problem. When we first started, we, anything that, uh, that failed in our data center on the scale of a few racks or larger required us to drain the entire region. But by using some of these techniques, we were able to push the line so that in most places, for most switchboards, whenever the switchboard goes down, we don't have to drain the region. And we learned a bunch of stuff along the way in this process. Um, I think the most important thing um, that I learned out of this was just to focus on the visibility and the metrics up front. So we started the project by doing a ton of analysis, reading a bunch of old incident reports, trying to find out what actually the high priority issues were. And that's how we both settled on our fault domain and also proved to people that this was a problem worth working on. And then even once we had some idea about the problem, the first code we wrote wasn't to fix the problem, it was to audit even further and you know, help teams understand where they were vulnerable. And what I learned through this experience is that going to data centers and performing maintenances and doing live testing is very important. Without having done all this live testing, I don't think I would have learned all the different ways that our data centers and our services could fail. And all the unexpected things that we saw helped us make our auditor better by looking at it because of what we learned during the live testing. So we didn't do this work on our own, of course. We have to acknowledge the rest of the a DR team, disaster readiness team at Facebook. Um, this is just a small selection of the people um, who worked on the hardware and software and across application teams to help us be more tolerant to uh, subregion outages. And now if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. Yep, we have.